All right, folks, welcome back. So now we'll learn about uh, the process of learning to fly and some of the regulations around it that will be on the test. All right, so when you learn to fly, you'll uh, pre-flight the aircraft with the instructor and learn about that, how to inspect everything. Um, the first few lessons are really about learning to see the aircraft attitude, seeing whether you're pitched up, pitched down, uh, banked left or right, most people have a fairly easy time with. Then you learn to take off and land. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, that takes about five or 10 hours. And in fact, people used to solo after four hours of uh, flight training, especially uh, young people. Now it takes a little longer because they want you to know about more bureaucracy and how to talk to the control tower and so forth. Um, a good trainer airplane, uh, why not uh, start with the best and just learn how to fly your uh, personal Gulfstream or whatever? Um, if it's a very heavy airplane like a Gulfstream, which can weigh 100,000 pounds, then you have to think ahead because of inertia. The airplane tends to keep doing whatever it was doing five or 10 seconds earlier. Uh, at the same time, though, a really tiny airplane like uh, some of the little two-seaters, um, they are unstable and they just get kicked around by the wind so much that you're not sure if it's something you did or something that uh, the environment did to you. Also, people have gotten heavier. Uh, the owner of East Coast Aero Club says that when he started in the 80s, 85% of the customers and instructors could train in the two-seat Piper Tomahawk. Now 85% require training in the uh, four-seat Piper Warrior. Um, you don't want it to be uh, too powerful, actually. And that's because when you go from, uh, on a go around, for example, when you go from near idle power to full power, that's a huge transition. And those left turning tendencies uh, that Tina mentioned mean that you need uh, immediate uh, and uh, significant rudder input and so forth. So an airplane that has a narrower band of possible powers is easier to learn on. Uh, you want something that won't spin if uh, it's abused and also, Ideally, an airplane that if you just let go, the Cessnas tend to have this characteristic. They'll come out of uh, most bad situations if uh, you just let go of the yoke. So the best trainers, uh, I, my personal favorite is the Diamond DA-40. It's kind of physically uncomfortable, which is why uh, I don't use it as a family airplane anymore. Uh, the Cessna 172 and Piper Warrior are the most popular. Uh, you can check these out. The Cirrus SR-20 is the most popular personal or the 20 and the 22 together, the most popular uh, family and personal airplane these days. They're OK trainers, and some uh, airline training programs and college training programs use them. But uh, they're uh, a little bit uh, more challenging to handle than the Cessnas, Diamonds, and Pipers. Uh, the marginal operating cost of all of these is about 100 to $150 an hour. So flight schools usually have to mark that up. Uh, a bit in order to stay in business because they have to cover the fixed costs as well of owning the aircraft, hangering, um, and uh, paying insurance. But uh, and that that cost includes you know the fuel and uh, the engine overhaul and the prop overhaul. Uh, what about doing gliders? Um, so we don't want to sell you too hard on uh, the idea of just starting in a single engine uh, land airplane. You can. Uh, go out to Sterling, Massachusetts, get towed up to 3,000 feet, and then on a handful of uh, good summer days, uh, stay up uh, by soaring in the thermals. Uh, ridge lifts, people have soared all the way down for uh, I think about 1,000 miles, tend to be the record for soaring. Uh, that's usually on uh, following the edge of a mountain range where the wind blowing, uh, let's say from the west, generates uh, a lift right at the uh, on the western edge of the mountain range or right in the center. Uh, you can be a Captain Sully style hero on uh, every landing actually. Uh, raise your hand if you think that there was another pilot in the aircraft with Captain Sully or if he was by himself. Who thinks that there was a second pilot in there? OK, who knows the name of the second pilot? Without going to your phone, does anybody in this room know the name of that second pilot? All right. It's Jeffrey Skiles or Skiles or something. Jeff Skiles. Jeff Skiles, all right. <laughs> Hold on a sec. We got to give this guy his reward. 
I'll pay out $20 at <laughs> a student for that answer. <laughs> I only brought a handful of uh, cash because I knew I wouldn't need most of it. <laughs> OK, a good trainer helicopter. Uh, same issues. Uh, the really light helicopters, the Robinson R-22 is very popular for training because it's inexpensive to operate. But it's so light that it's unstable and gives people the impression that uh, heroic skills are required. Uh, also, you want reasonable amount of rotor inertia for auto rotations. And helicopters, a lot of the training after those 10 hours, uh, after you've learned to fly, you also need to learn to fly a helicopter with no engine. And uh, that requires um, making some adjustments in the pitch of the uh, rotating blades um, or rotating, spinning wings. Um, so if there's no inertia in those uh, blades, then it becomes a little bit harder to control during the auto rotation. Uh, if you're a student, you may not make the best landings, so uh, rugged skids. Uh, this ends up all pointing towards the Robinson R-44. It's a four-seat helicopter, and uh, those extra two empty seats in the back give you a lot of performance margin. That's more expensive to operate, and therefore the prices that flight schools have to charge are higher because all the rotating components get thrown out every 2,200 hours. The blades, the transmissions, uh, there's more that gets overhauled. OK, you can get a pilot certificate from the FAA by doing your pre-solo written exam with an instructor on the characteristics of the aircraft and anything that's uh, important locally. Uh, then you do some solo flight after your training. You'll do uh, some flights by yourself. Uh, you will do cross-country trips. So you will go with an instructor on some trips that are at least 50 nautical miles if you're in an airplane. Uh, 25 in a helicopter, that's called cross country. You don't have to go all the way to California uh, or Alaska. Uh, and then you'll do uh, a bit of solo cross country flying. Uh, you will do uh, check ride preparation. That has to be, I believe, at least three hours in prep with an instructor for your check ride. And once you take your check ride with an FAA employee or a designated pilot examiner, uh, you get issued the pilot certificate. It takes you about 40 hours of flight time. And uh, I believe only 10 of that has to be uh, solo. Uh, the other 30 is typically with an instructor. Uh, 55 hours is probably more typical, but young people like yourselves who do it intensively uh, can come and finish in pretty close to the 40 hours. There's my certificate. Notice it says uh, airline transport pilot there. Ooh, let's use the fancier feature. Airline transport pilot. So that's a different level of certificate. There's private, commercial, and ATP, again, beyond the scope. Notice also there's a hole punched in it, because uh, when you get an additional rating, they issue a new certificate and destroy the old one. Oops. OK, uh, what can you do once you have your private? You can go anywhere in the world in a US registered airplane um, and uh, carry uh, friends and family, as long as you're not charging them money. Uh, you can fly at night. Uh, that's not true in some other countries, but it is true in the US. You don't need any additional uh, rating to fly at night. You will have had three hours of training at night flying with an instructor. Uh, and you will fly what you learned in. So if your mom has a hot air balloon and that was your first aircraft, you will have a rating for um, flying that hot air balloon. Um, it doesn't have to, you don't have to start with a uh, Cessna uh, or similar. OK, so Congress passes kind of uh, loose laws about aviation. But really, most of the uh, things that you might think of as laws governing flying are actually regulations that are drafted by the uh, bureaucrats in the uh, FAA and the agency. Uh, a lot of this stuff is uh, public. You can look up anybody who. Uh, claims to be a pilot in the airman registry. One reason it's not called a pilot registry is that there are actually other functions for which certificates are issued. For example, flight engineer. Maybe in the old days there was navigator. Uh, similarly, airplanes. If you see an interesting airplane, uh, you can look up the tail number and see to whom it's registered. Sometimes it's obscured with uh, you know, a shell LLC somewhere. But it can, uh, it can be interesting. OK. This is one of the worst parts of the FAA. 
uh, in the exam. They use the words category and classes in two different ways. One is for getting your pilot certificate, in which case a category is something like airplane or uh, rotorcraft. Uh, and then you have this class, which could be um, you know, multi-engine C in the case of this Grumman. Uh, I think it might be a Mallard there on the right, the 1940s Grumman seaplane. So that's a multi-engine C rating that you would have uh, in the airplane category. Here's your uh, little matrix. You can uh, study this from the books, but you see these are the different uh, categories of aircraft here on the left. Some of the fun ones like powered parachute, weight shift control. Uh, fortunately, there are no flight schools uh, for those kind of aircraft that I know of in the area. It wouldn't be much fun in a New England February. Uh, category class, very exciting. OK, uh, so just to give you an overview of the pilot and instructor certification, uh, on the left here, you have your levels of pilot. We're concentrating on private pilot. Recreational pilot is extremely unpopular. Uh, sport pilot is just a handful of schools for that as well. Uh, so really, it's private, commercial, ATP are the three core levels of a pilot certificate. To those, you add ratings. So airplane, single engine, land, that lets you fly the Icon A5 seaplane that you might have seen. Um, and uh, you also need type ratings for heavier or turbojet powered aircraft. That means you've had special training for your DC-3, uh, which is heavy, or for your Boeing 737, which has turbojets. OK, uh, the flight instructor has a separate certificate. And that has its own set of uh, ratings, which are simpler. So single engine airplane, notice it doesn't say land or sea. So I have a commercial seaplane rating. Uh, and I have an instructor certificate for single engine airplane. So for anybody who wants to die uh, by drowning, I can offer you instruction in a single engine seaplane, or a multi-engine seaplane, for that matter, although there are not too many of those. Uh, there is a totally separate certificate. If you are also passionate about drones, you'll end up with three pieces of plastic. Uh, one for the pilot certi certification, one for the instructor, and one for being a remote pilot. OK, so aircraft, they use the same words, but to mean different things. Uh, we will have uh, a normal or utility category of aircraft, or acrobatic. Those are the three that you're going to see uh, at your uh, typical flight school. Uh, on the right there is the Game Bird, a very interesting plane that I just flew in. Uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. I would encourage you guys to look that up. And then you have class. So you can have, you know, if you have a really big helicopter, it's a transport category and uh, rotorcraft uh, class. All right, there on the right is, uh, I think that's a Pitcairn auto gyro. So that's a rotorcraft uh, auto gyro from uh, the 1930s. That's a replica at, uh, from Oshkosh, which we'll hear about at lunchtime. OK, uh, the bureaucracies. Um, you have the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, a little bit separate from the FAA, which is part of the Department of uh, Transportation. The structure of regulations, um, the Code of Federal Regulations is huge. I think it's doubled in size in the last 20 years or so. Uh, the FAA is part of that in Title 14, if you look up. Uh, the FARs, the Federal Aviation Regulations, oftentimes you'll be directed to a site that has the entire electronic code of federal regulations. Um, the most relevant parts uh, for this class are 61, what does it mean to become a pilot? And part 91, what can you do if you're flying privately? Um, if you want to have fun extra knowledge, uh, these are some of the other FARs that are occasionally worth looking at. Uh, you can look at uh, doing charter and airline operations. Those have air carrier certificates. And then you add something for scheduled big airplanes like FAR 121 or smaller charter airplanes 135. Uh, if you want to see what kind of engineering uh, you have to demonstrate to the FAA to get your uh, product certified, you can look into, for example, FAR 27 to see what Robinson had to do. Uh, for the R44 to show that it was uh, safe. Okay, 
Uh, FAR 61 uh, is about pilots, flight instructors, ground instructors. Uh, the standards are actually sort of reasonable. Like you have to do a flight review with an instructor every two years in order to uh, continue to exercise the privileges of your certificate. Um, if you want to add, uh, for example, the capability to fly in the clouds, that's the instrument rating uh, that Tina was talking about, and that's in FAR uh, 61.65. Uh, um, some of these are just sign-offs, like for high performance or complex, you just need an endorsement from an instructor that you did it. For the type ratings, you'll actually get a new pilot certificate after uh, you know, usually simulator training at a uh, simulator center. All right, so these are some of the things that you need to know for the test. Uh, you have to, um, until 9-11, until the pilot certificate was a piece of paper, I think, and the photo ID was not required. So you could just go out and fly with your piece of paper and uh, your medical certificate. Uh, now you don't need that, actually, because of this thing called basic med. Um, you have to, you know, I guess, that uh, you have to know, I think, for some test question that they can be inspected by these various agencies. All right, uh, drugs and alcohol. This is actually one of the worst parts of the FAA certification projects for young people. People my age, we don't get invited to parties, so <laughs> getting arrested for DUI is not really an issue. But I know this guy, really wonderful young guy, about 20, very enthusiastic, very smart. He was in college, you know, he was drinking, and uh, you know, he got arrested for DUI, and the FAA treated him you know, like they would you know, if I were arrested for DUI, it would mean that I was an alcoholic. But, you know, he was not an alcoholic, but they don't have different standards. So they, say, they can't just say, well, he's in college, so of course he's drinking. Uh, they said, well, he's an alcoholic, so they wanted him to do years of proving that he went to, you know, alcohol treatment programs and all this other stuff. Uh, so really you have to be, um, you have to report any time that uh, you have an alcohol-related infraction with a motor vehicle, and that's how I would say this is probably the number one reason that pilots lose their certificates. Uh, marijuana, uh, I was just in Haiti, actually, and this shaman was showing, not the tourist part of Haiti, of course, but the, uh, you know, the authentic Haiti. So the shaman was showing us the 50 different medicinal plants that they used to treat various ailments. And I said, you know, you guys are so primitive. In Massachusetts, we have one plant that people say will cure almost any kind of problem, and that's medical marijuana. So uh, you, can't really, it's, you can't really be a stoner and honestly answer the questions on the, uh, despite the legality in Massachusetts, you can't be a stoner and hold your pilot certificate because you're supposed to tell the FAA about you know, your glaucoma and you know, how you're treating it with medical marijuana. So uh, the certificate uh, duration is two years for flight instructors. They want us to do recurrent training or sign off so many students that we don't need it. Uh, for remote pilot, they want you to pass a test every two years. The pilot certificate never expires. Here's a couple pictures from uh, last week. I was out in Sonoma, California, and I stumbled on this airport where uh, one pilot was flying this 1940s Howard airplane that you see on the left, and another pilot was flying this P-51 Mustang, which on a 2,500-foot runway, that's a pretty short runway, uh, for, and it's very windy, uh, nasty uh, wind patterns off the bay. So that's kind of a short runway for a $3 million uh, airplane. Those were $1,500, by the way, when the government sold them as surplus at the end of World War II. Uh, but anyway, those pilot certificates never expire. Somebody could not fly for 30 years, go out and uh, do a little bit of recurrent training and get signed off by an instructor for a flight review and fly again, assuming, uh, I guess, they he or she would need to get a uh, renewed medical certificate. Uh, for you all, uh, you're going to have a third class medical that will be valid for five years. Everything's based on calendar months, so if you get it on the 1st of June, it will expire at the end of June, uh, five years later. Uh, airline pilots need first class medicals. Uh, f the captain needs a first class medical by regulation. Um, might be true of the first officer, too. In just ordinary charter use or doing helicopter sightseeing or whatever, that's a second class uh, medical operation. Uh, one th reason that people like sport pilot and glider flying is that these medicals are not required. 
So if they think that they might not pass uh, a medical, then they'll transition to uh, one of those. I think they say that you have to have a current driver's license and you know, kind of, it's a little bit of self-reporting. You have to basically uh, consider yourself to be healthy. Um, basic med, you start with the third class during your training, and then you'll um, go every uh, four years to a regular doctor. You can see in FAR 61113 that there's a limit to what you can do under basic med. You can't fly a, a heavy, fast airplane uh, with a lot of people in it. OK, uh, for most tests, you need an endorsement from an instructor. Uh, for the check ride, uh, it can be, you can pass it, it can be discontinued, maybe the weather turned bad. Uh, you can fail, usually on one or two maneuvers. Uh, you can retake the failed test, which might only be on those one or two maneuvers at the examiner's discretion. Uh, you have to log uh, sufficient to prove to the FAA that you meet currency requirements, like you've done three takeoffs and landings within the last 90 days if you're carrying passengers. Uh, or that you had a flight review within two years. Uh, that's from a, I have a nephew in medical school. Um, so uh, you're supposed to ground yourself if you get sick. So you got a medical certificate five years ago, but you know if you're not fit to fly, then you ground yourself as a regulation about that. Uh, the flight review requires. Um, uh, an hour of ground and an hour of flight at a minimum, or whatever the instructor thinks that you need to be safe. Or if you get a new pilot certificate, for example, because you got an instrument rating, then uh, the flight review is not required. So oftentimes people who are enthusiastic about it, they won't have a flight review for the first five or 10 years of their aviation journey because they keep getting new certificates for this or that. Uh, the insurance requirements for more complex aircraft usually require training uh, every 12 months. So they essentially are more stringent than the FAA requirements. Uh, OK, so as I mentioned, uh, you need to have done some recent flying by yourself uh, or with passengers um, before you can take additional passengers. And if you're going to carry passengers at night, uh, which is defined for uh, this currency as one hour after sunset, um, to one hour before sunrise, you have to have done three takeoffs and landings to a full stop before you can carry passengers at night. This is the one where people often have trouble uh, maintaining their currency and have to make a special trip to the airport to build currency. Um, this has to be in category, class, and type, if applicable. So if it's a jet, you have to, if, if you're typed in a Boeing 737, uh, you have to have done the three takeoffs and landings at night in your Boeing 737 to be uh, current, to take more passengers at night. It's not enough to do it just in a uh, Cessna 172. Uh, the flight review, oddly enough, doesn't work that way. You can do it in any of the aircraft for which you're uh, rated. Uh, again, the insurance company might be stricter about that. OK, uh, tell the FAA if you move. Uh, this is packing up for a recent trip to Florida. So it sure looked like we were moving. Um, let me tell you, once you have a light aircraft and a family, every trip becomes just like that movie Sophie's Choice. You have to decide who or what is going to be left behind. It's pretty painful. OK, student pilot. Uh, before you can solo, you pass a little written test that's kind of chosen and given by the CFI. Uh, you have to receive training on specific listed maneuvers that are in this FAR, 6187. You get signed off for solo flight, uh, and that has to be renewed every 90 days. Um, you can't uh, take passengers or go above a broken or overcast layer. So as unwise as it may sound, if you're only visually rated, you can take off, fly over clouds with the expectation that when you get to your airport, the weather's forecast to be clear, or at least you're hoping it'll be clear. Well, they won't let you do that if you're a student pilot. The CFI may also add other limitations, like a maximum wind, for example. Uh, each each cross-country flight, so if you're going from, for example, Hanscom Field up to Portland, Maine as a solo cross-country or to Keene, New Hampshire, that requires uh, that you do the flight plan and review it with the CFI. It doesn't have to be your regular CFI and have the CFI sign off that your uh, planning is adequate. You can actually fly in 
Bravo airspace. We'll get into that uh, a little bit later. The most controlled airspace in the US, basically, right around the biggest airports. Uh, however, you have to have a sign off from the flight instructor. Uh, you can actually land at a class Bravo airport. Salt Lake City has a flight school. So they obviously have people who are soloing at uh, a, a huge commercial airport. However, uh, in the FARS Appendix D, some airports are excluded from uh, student use of the actual runways as opposed to the airspace. Logan happens to be one of them. OK, so once you get your private pilot certificate, what can you do? This is what I like to do. Fly over Boston. Uh, I got the family in the back. We start in the Cirrus. We end up at Provincetown. We find the whales by, you know, after careful study of marine biology, I've learned that the best way to find whales is to look for a whale watching boat. Uh, they're just <laughs> offshore. It saves actually a lot of time. It's about 20 minutes to P-Town. And uh, the whale watch cruises that leave from P-Town, you know, those are three or four hours. So uh, this is a very efficient way to see the whales. OK, who is eligible? A lot of people solo on their 16th birthday. And uh, they get uh, a pilot certificate uh, on their 17th birthday. Um, you can do it even a little bit younger, a year younger, in gliders and balloons. Um, you must have that CFI sign off to take the practical test, pass the knowledge test that's kind of the end of this course, and uh, meet the experience requirements. That means at least uh, you know, 40 hours of total time, three hours of night, and so forth, 10 hours of solo. OK, uh, flight proficiency. So this is the stuff uh, that's in the Airman Certification Standards that we talked about. So it says you know, you got to be able to uh, fly uh, a power, uh, power off landing. You've got to be able to uh, you know, do a soft, demonstrate a soft field takeoff, like how you would take off if you were on grass and so forth. Uh, everything's in there, including some basic instrument training. Actually, the FAA has three hours of training, and they want you to demonstrate that you can fly by reference to instruments at least, at least uh, well enough to get back out of the cloud that you uh, inadvertently flew into. Uh, so as I noted, you need 20 hours of training from a CFI minimum, 10 hours solo minimum. The other 10 hours is at your discretion. Almost all people would choose to do that with an instructor because it's not a big added cost compared to the airplane rental. Um, the training from the CFI uh, will include one long cross country. That's kind of the interesting part. Uh, 100 mile nautical mile cross country. I think it has to stop at uh, three different airports. So the one you took off from and two more, like a triangle flight. Uh, and uh, those three hours of instrument training I told you about and the three hours of test prep within two calendar months. Um, Oh, yeah, so actually, sorry, I was, I was mistaken about this one. 100 nautical mile cross country flight at night does not require uh, three legs. But your solo, you have to do one solo 150 nautical mile trip, three legs of uh, you know, about 50 nautical miles each, with one at least 50 nautical. So that's the one that, uh, where the FAA thinks, OK, this person's really good to go and start taking his or her friends, which, as I said earlier, you, know, you might think that, that might not be what the friends want. <laughs> they might say, no, I'd rather be in a five-seat Cirrus with uh, you and a more experienced pilot in the front, and uh, we'll sit in the back and party. All right. Uh, so this is a little bit tricky. Um, but basically, you can fly if it's part of your business. So you know, if your company requires you to get to a meeting, you can do that with a private pilot certificate. Uh, generally, though, um, you have to be paying for most of the stuff that you do. You can't let your friends you know, pay the full cost of renting the airplane, for example. Uh, you can tow a glider. There's kind of, kind of elaborate rules that have get, gotten more complex every year about how to uh, do charity flights. Uh, but it can be done. Uh, regulation versus insurance. So here's a question for you. What if, hypothetically speaking, somebody shut down the government and there was no FAA? <laughs> could, this, could this work? And I think actually it could. You would just say it's illegal to fly without insurance. Because let's think about it. The FAA says that you can go to East Coast Aero Club, 
fly around in a Piper Warrior, get your certificate, and then just get a couple sign-offs from an instructor for complex, high performance, actually I guess it's three, high altitude. And then, you know, at 43 hours of flight time, you get yourself into this $5 million Pilatus PC-12. You've got the entire family. You pitch your tent at Oshkosh. Everybody's happy. Well, that's legal from the FAA's point of view. But the insurance company says, you know, we don't really want to buy you a new Pilatus after you go sideways off the runway at Oshkosh. So we're not going to let you do that. You don't have enough experience. You're going to need specific training for the airplane. The FAA, again, this is a single engine land airplane. It's not over 12,500 pounds, so you don't need a type rating. And therefore, you could just you know, get in there. Uh, most people don't lock the doors, so just jump in, push the start button, and go. FAA is happy. Well, again, the insurance company wouldn't have let you do that to begin with. So if this complex regulatory environment didn't exist, but insurance were required, I think you'd end up with something that was uh, substantially uh, similar and basically the same. The FAA system, I will say, in favor of it, it's kind of motivational. It's sort of like the badge system that the Boy Scouts, I guess they're not Boy Scouts anymore. The Scouts and the Girl Scouts, they're still the Girl Scouts, that the Scouts run. Um, and it motivates people to get the next one. Uh, Everything except the drones is hanging off either the pilot or the CFI certificate. Uh, and just remember that you're going to stay FAA current by flying every quarter and with an instructor every two years. A lot of people in New England, though, they don't fly much during the winter, so they go up and do a currency flight uh, in the springtime before the flying season starts. So while you're thinking about your questions uh, about the regulatory framework or learning to fly, I'll just show you a flight that you could do with just a private. There is an entangled whale in New York Harbor with fishing gear all over him. And the people that could untangle him were in Provincetown. So Noah asked me to volunteer, because they knew they had my email uh, from the sea turtle flights. They said, hey, would you mind flying over Boston, picking these guys up in Provincetown, going over New York Harbor uh, to uh, in, in the area just outside of it uh, to look for the whale? land him on the New Jersey shore so they can get into a Zodiac boat and chase after the whales. Uh, they didn't tell me to go visit my parents in DC, but I did while they were out chasing the whale. Uh, and then come back, and uh, I dropped them off, I think, right just after sunset. I landed at Provincetown uh, after sunset, and then I did a night flight over water <laughs> in a single engine plane that's about to it's reach, it's just reached its 2,000 hour overhaul uh, for the engine. So maybe that wasn't the wisest thing to do, but I did have a life jacket and, and a raft. Um, so that was an entire day of flying from about 7 a.m. to about, uh, I don't know, 9 p.m. when I landed back in Hanscom. And I think that didn't require more than a private certificate because it's all volunteer. People say, like, have you ever been scared? Philip, you've flown 4,000 hours. What's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? And I think, actually, it was on this flight. Because if you see, there's that IFR. That's an, that's an IFR intersection that the FAA came up with. So for those of you who uh, are familiar with Judaism, you will know that is not something you ever want to see. <laughs> All right, so who has a question about that material, or should, or should we zip in the systems? Are there any medical conditions that would like prohibit you from flying altogether? Uh, the question is, are there any medical conditions that really preclude a person from getting a pilot certificate or getting the medical to go with a pilot certificate? I guess you need the medical to get it because you need to solo. The FAA, they have an exemption pro process, and they have their own physicians in Oklahoma City that review. So usually, you can work with an aviation medical examiner and get some kind of exception. Diabetics, they're kind of concerned about, but if the person has a long history of controlling it well, they'll usually give an exemption. People have you know, heart bypasses, and then they have to go through some rehabilitation process that makes the FAA happy. Uh, so it's all laid out. There's a lot of stuff online about the standards that they use. And it's complicated. But the, the doctors, there's a lot of good local aviation examiners. One of them works uh, right at Cambridge Hospital. So uh, that's an, a fairly easy question to get answered. Uh, 